Mr. Mosier, thank you very much for coming on today. And you've been in this fight for how many years now? <laughs> I've been in this fight since I was in an operating room in China in March of 1980 when they were forcibly aborting women at, at seven, eight, and nine months of pregnancy, and they were doing it by cesarean section. Stephen Mosier is an internationally recognized expert on China. He's a best-selling author and speaker, and also serves as the president of the Population Research Institute. His latest book is called Bully of Asia, Why China's Dream is the New Threat to World Order. Mr. Mosher's articles have appeared in the Wall Street Journal, Reader's Digest, The Washington Post, National Review, and many other publications. He was a pro-abortion atheist at one time, but after going to China and witnessing what communism does to the family, he reconsidered his position. Although I must say, I never really thought about the issue. I consider it to be a, a woman's issue. Uh, it wasn't an issue that I, as a young man, had ever had to deal with personally. Uh, but what brought it home, what made it personal, what brought it, you know, up close was being in the operating room. I was standing, you know, six feet away from the operating table while two People's Liberation Army surgeons were doing forced abortions on women. And, uh, you know, I realized in a way that, you know, it was unavoidable to reach the conclusion that uh, they were killing uh babies that were perfectly capable of surviving outside the womb uh, with moderate care. And the deaths of these tiny sons of Adam and little daughters of Eve uh, weighed on my conscience. And, and so I initially began to think, uh, you know, where can I draw the line? Is there a point at which uh, abortion would be okay in pregnancy and after which it would not be okay? It was clearly not okay in the third trimester of pregnancy. And I thought back about the second trimester and I learned about fetal development and I went back earlier in the, the first trimester and there was no point at which I could draw that line. It was clear to me that human life, just based on the biology of it, was a continuum from conception uh, to natural birth. And, and so I became um, thoroughly pro-life. Well, it makes a lot of sense. And especially if you look back at the history of communism, Communist Russia was the first country to legalize abortion in the 20s. So there is a connection between the culture of death and communism. And I think you saw it when you went to China. Oh, absolutely. There's a, a connection in several respects. First of all, there's a connection because uh, communism completely devalues human life, right? We as, as, as Catholics believe uh, that, that, that God uh, created man in his image and that the state exists to serve the people. Uh, in communism, uh, they don't believe in God. They believe the state should be God and that people exist to serve the state. And if you devalue human life in that way, it's no surprise that not only do you legalize uh, abortion, but you exterminate restless minorities. Uh, you execute more people every year. China executes more people every year than the rest of the world combined. Uh, 20,000 people are executed in China every year. All of the other human rights abuses, uh, the destruction of the family, all stem from the fact that, the, that, that atheistic communism rejects God, uh, rejects man as anything more than a higher animal, and insists that the state uh, dominate everything and everyone. It all follows from that. I noticed on LifeSite News you wrote an article, many would call it politically incorrect, where you state, everyone who falls ill or dies from the Chinese coronavirus is a victim of the Chinese Communist Party. They will own this virus for all time. I hope it will come to be known as the Chinese Communist Party coronavirus. What is the connection between communism and COVID-19? Well, the answer to that question is fairly long, but, but let me summarize it by saying that this uh, coronavirus uh, is an artifact. Uh, it is not a naturally occurring coronavirus. I know that uh, a lot of uh, Chinese virologists have been forced to say that it came from nature to man without uh, the, ne the necessity of any uh, human intervention. But they're forced to say that by the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, some Western virologists have also said that this cannot be engineered because we see no trace uh, that it was genetically engineered. But it's been very clear now for the last 
seven years that it is possible to do genetic engineering using recombinant technology and not leave a trace of your work. Uh, it's like doing surgery uh, without, using, without leaving a scar uh, from the scalpel. You can do it so cleanly uh, that there, you leave no traces behind of your work. Uh, we know that they can do that because there have been articles published in the scientific literature, in the uh, genetics literature, in the virology literature, uh, saying exactly that. I did study and work on a genomics project at Stanford University with uh, Professor uh, Luigi Cavalli Sforza uh, some years ago as well. So I can read the literature and I understand what it's saying. And what it's saying is that, that this particular virus, which came originally from a horseshoe bat, has an unusual insertion in it that is not found in any other coronavirus that could only have gotten there by the hand of man. And that's why I say that the Chinese Communist Party owns this virus because it was created in their lab in Wuhan at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. It was created as part, I believe, of their uh, bioweapons research. I'm not saying it itself is a bioweapon. I'm saying that they have had for decades a bioweapons research program uh, in violation of the 1984 convention prohibiting such research. And also I assert that this escaped from the lab. It escaped from the lab because it was created to be highly infectious. In fact, it was so infectious that because of the poor lab procedure practiced in the Wuhan Institute of Virology and because of the poor training received by the lab technicians there, it managed to infect them. And from infecting a lab technician, it leaped out into the population of Wuhan, a city of 11 million people, and spread quickly from there throughout the rest of China. And then, to make matters worse, it was deliberately seeded by the Chinese Communist Party throughout the world. So let's go back and, 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 and rehearse that a little bit. They created the virus. It leaked from their lab. They allowed it to spread, not only allowed it to spread uh, throughout the world, they deliberately seeded it throughout the world. That's why I say that this is the Chinese Communist Party virus. It was created by them, leaked from their lab, and spread throughout the world uh, on their orders. So that's why they own it. And everybody in the world uh, who has lost a grandmother or a grandfather, everybody in the world who's fallen sick from the coronavirus, everybody who's lost a business or lost a job because of the CCP virus, uh, is a victim of the Chinese Communist Party. The World Health Organization has been uh, part of the cover-up uh, that has been carried out by the Chinese Communist Party uh, from the beginning of the infection in Wuhan. Uh, they've covered it up by lying about the fact that there is human-to-human -human trans transmission of the virus. Originally, the Communist Party, echoed by the World Health Organization, said there was no human-to-human -human transmission which meant, of course, if it were true, it wasn't true, but if it had been true, that would have meant that it would have been very hard to contract the disease. In fact, we now know, and what, what the Chinese Communist Party and the World Health Organization knew from early days, uh, we now know that it's highly infectious. It's about 100 times, in fact, more infectious uh, than the ordinary flu. Uh, based on in vitro studies, that is, you know, studies in a test tube where you put the virus together with human uh, lung tissue and see how rapidly the infection occurs. So it's highly infectious. It was engineered to be highly infectious. And had we known that, had we known that at the beginning, uh, we could have contained the epidemic in the city of Wuhan. But we didn't know that. The, the World Health Organization lied to us about that. It also lied to us about the seriousness of the epidemic in China. We know from German intelligence, not from the CIA, uh, but from German intelligence intercepts, that a phone call between Dr. Tedros, the head of the World Health Organization, and the dictator for life, president for life, Xi Jinping, took place in mid-January. And what Dr. Tedros was told by President Xi was this, uh, please do not declare this to be a pandemic. Uh, we have everything under control. And Dr. Tedros meekly complied and told the world, there's no need to, to declare this to be a pandemic. 
China has everything under control. So he was simply, as Beijing's man at the World Health Organization, repeating Beijing's lies. Uh, that's why we're in the state that we're in today. So not only do we have the Chinese Communist Party virus, we also have a World Health Organization that, as far as I'm concerned, uh, should be named uh, the China Health Organization. Uh, what in the world is a health organization doing when it propagates lies about an infectious disease that actually helps to spread the disease instead of contain it? Uh, you know, the Chinese Health Organization, maybe, or maybe we should call it the World Disease Organization. It's certainly not the World Health Organization. Now, how do you think the Communist Party will try to capitalize on the ensuing chaos that the coronavirus provoked in the world? Well, here's, here's an interesting point. I believe that when the Chinese Communist Party realized uh, that one of its uh, bioweapons under study had escaped from the lab, uh, they faced a choice. They could either endure the epidemic uh, alone and control it, try to control it within their borders, and suffer a tremendous loss of human life and economic losses, or they could spread it throughout the world and ensure that the rest of the world suffered a loss of human life and tremendous economic losses as well. And I believe that the highest leadership of the Chinese Communist Party, which means core leader, as he's now called, or people's leader, as he's now called, Xi Jinping, decided that if China was going to go down, that it was going to take the rest of the world with it. And so that's exactly uh, what transpired. So now we have the Chinese economy up and running again, perhaps sooner than the rest of the world, because after all, the virus spread first in China and then a month or two later was spread throughout the world. And China is trying to take advantage of the temporary weakness of the European economies and the temporary weakness of the American economies to expand its reach throughout the world. It is trying to buy up on the cheap distressed European and American and Japanese companies. Now, thank God, most of the countries, including the United States, are not going to allow that to happen. But you can see what their plan would have been. Their plan would have been to take a flourishing company that was temporarily fell on hard times because of the CCP virus and buy it for pennies on the dollar, buy it on the cheap. Um, that's kind of, I don't know, ghoulish behavior. That's not only profiting from someone else's misery, it's profiting from the misery that you yourself caused in the world. Now, Japan has said nothing doing. The Japanese government has said, we're going to pay Japanese companies to move production out of China. And we're not going to allow China to buy Japanese companies on the cheap. And the companies that move out of China, according to the Japanese government's program, do not have to move back to Japan. They can move to Taiwan, South Korea, Indonesia, the United States. They can move anywhere. Just leave China, Japan says. We're going to do something similar. The Germans have already said we're putting a year moratorium on the purchase by any Chinese-owned company of any German company. So they're protecting uh, their, their assets. They're protecting their industrial base. So uh, China is attempting to profit from the misery that it's caused. Uh, hopefully they won't be able to do so now that we're alerted uh, to the threat that China poses, not just, you know, in trade terms, not just in economic terms, not just in terms of its constant, incessant cyber attacks, not just in terms of the theft of $600 billion of intellectual property around every year from the United States. It actually now is a threat to our health and well-being. Um, that, that's a real threat that I think has been brought home to, uh, to most Americans. Now, up until the coronavirus, uh, it seemed like the United States was fairly naive about trading with China, about, you know, letting entire companies go to China. Yeah, I, and I wouldn't so much call it naivete. I would call it a willful blindness uh, to the evil uh, that the Chinese Communist Party has committed against its own people and now against the world at large. And it's really not naivete, it's greed. Uh, greed. It, it was uh, greed that drove them to try to get a share of the uh, the China market. Now, uh, a lot of us have have been uh, have had their eyes open about China for a long time. I mean, I realized in the aftermath of the Tiananmen massacre on June fourth of nineteen eighty nine, which was kind of the high water mark of the democracy movement in China, where you had a million people in the streets of Beijing, 
in the weeks leading up to the June 4th massacre, uh, demanding liberty, demanding an end to one-party dictatorship, demanding an end to corruption. Uh, that ended with the massacre of 10,000 people in the central square of the capital city of the People's Republic of China. And after that, I realized that China was not going our way. However much we transferred technology to China, however many billions of dollars worth of cheap Chinese goods we purchased, however many American factories uh, opened up in China, that, that the Chinese Communist Party was determined to maintain an absolute control of the country. But more importantly, uh, the president of the United States, Donald Trump, uh, wrote a book in 1999 in which he condemned China's cheating on trade, condemned its theft of intellectual property, condemned its uh, depreciation of its currency, all the things that we see uh, the Trump administration taking action on against China now. Um, you know, Trump has been on this for 20 years. Now, opposing that for the last 30 years have been, I think, three forces. Uh, Wall Street has been absolutely opposed to doing anything to stop China's rise because Wall Street has benefited tremendously from helping Chinese companies list uh, themselves on the New York Stock Exchange and raise money from American capital markets. Uh, China has raised probably five or six trillion dollars from of U.S. capital from U.S. capital markets. Uh, they would like now, in the midst of their economic downturn, to raise another two or three trillion. We have to stop that. But my point here, the point here is that uh, Wall Street financiers have been the financial services arm of the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, selling out America for China for decades, that has to stop. And I think there are moves underway to stop it. Uh, we're going to delist every Chinese uh, state-owned and privately owned company that's currently listed on the New York Stock Exchange for one simple reason. Uh, they don't tell us uh, the truth about their balance sheets. American investors who invest in Chinese companies have no idea uh, what their balance sheets look like because standard accounting practices aren't followed. The other people who have, who have betrayed the United States, uh, many of them are in academe. Uh, why would uh, academic institutions like Harvard and Stanford and Yale uh, take a soft line towards China? Why would they become what we call panda huggers? Uh, because there's a lot of money at stake. Uh, the Department of Education has now done an investigation which shows that over the last six years that nine uh, hundred or rather six hundred billion six hundred million dollars sorry six hundred million dollars have been funneled from the Chinese Communist Party and Chinese organizations into American institutions of higher education. Uh, the big winner in that contest was Harvard. Harvard got $93 million. Uh, maybe that's why they allowed uh, President Xi Jinping's daughter to secretly attend Harvard a few years ago under an assumed name. Um, secretly? Secretly, yes. She was, she was there under an assumed name. We didn't find out that she was Xi Jinping's daughter until after she graduated. Now, Harvard knew perfectly well when they let her in, in I believe the year was 2011, who she was, but they let her in anyway. And they let her in because Harvard has been the recipient of tens of millions of dollars from China. Now, what that meant, of course, her admission meant that some hardworking, smart young woman from the United States was not admitted because the daughter of the dictator of China was given preferential treatment. Now, there are a lot of students and scholars from China at American universities. And they're there because they pay full freight, but they're also there because uh, mommy and daddy back in China may be high-ranking uh, Communist Party officials, oligarchs, I think we should call them, who've donated money to these universities and colleges. So we have an admission scandal at the University of Southern California that everybody knows about, right, where people gave money to sports coaches uh, in return for allowing uh, their sons and daughters to be admitted to the University of Southern California. Uh, this is small potatoes. This is nothing compared to the tens of millions of dollars that have come from the People's Republic of China, in return for which I believe that a number of the sons and daughters of the Communist Party elite have been admitted to American elite universities. This is the big scandal.
this is a big scandal, and it, it really hasn't begun to be uncovered yet. But when you take Chinese money, the Chinese Communist Party always expects good value in return for their quote-unquote donation. So when you take Chinese money, you're expected to admit their sons and daughters. Uh, maybe they uh, submitted false transcripts. Maybe they had someone else take the, uh, take the SAT test for them or the test of English as a foreign language for them. Maybe it's all fabricated, but they get admitted anyway. And, uh, you know, qualified, deserving American kids get passed over. And then you hire uh, scholars who take a soft line towards China because you don't want to offend China because China is giving you uh, donations, massive donations. So you compromise academic freedom. Best example of that is the president of Harvard a couple of years ago was in Beijing and had a meet and greet with dictator for life, Xi Jinping. On the same day, a number of Harvard scholars wanted to hold a roundtable on human rights violations in China. The roundtable was canceled. Why? Because Harvard University did not want to upset uh, their good relations with the People's Republic of China. So think about it. You weigh academic freedom on the one hand and donations from the most powerful communist country on the other. And what wins out? Not academic freedom. Yeah, unfortunately, that's the trend on college campuses, especially the Ivy Leagues. Uh, our volunteers see that. They see that every day. Well, I went to Stanford University. I was finishing up a PhD in anthropology when I was selected to be the first American social scientist on the ground in China in 30 years. It was quite an honor to be selected. When I was there, however, I found out uh, serious information about human rights abuses, not just in the one child policy with forced abortions and forced sterilizations, but about the mass famine after the Great Leap Forward, about the political persecution during the Cultural Revolution, about ongoing persecution of other religious groups in China. And when I came back to Stanford and began to speak out about these violations of human rights, Stanford administrators immediately wanted to hush me up. Uh, they immediately wanted me to stand down. And when I refused to stop writing and publishing about the human rights abuses committed in China by the Chinese Communist Party and its officials, uh, I was fired from Stanford University. So if you want to talk about the, the plague of, of uh, communist infiltration in American institutions of higher learning that has infected those institutions like Stanford, Harvard, and Yale, uh, I'm patient zero. <laughs> I'm patient zero. I was finally terminated from the university in 1985 by the president of the university who said that he didn't know whether the charges of spying that had been made against me by the Chinese Communist Party were true or not. He said, but there has been a gradual erosion of trust between you, Stephen Mosier, and the university, which makes it impossible for you to continue here. So they fired me because they didn't trust me. I was threatening to sink their slow boat towards China. Maybe because you were kicked out of Stanford, now you're able to do a lot of good in other areas. I think I got a pretty good deal. Uh, I, I like to say when I speak publicly about my experience, uh, what does it profit a man to gain tenure at Stanford University and lose his immortal soul? And uh, I'm happy. I'm happy. I'm happy to have saved my soul uh, at whatever price, a small price to pay. You'll be in the good company of St. Thomas More. Well, I hope so. <laughs> Now, the final question I have is about the Catholic Church in China. Uh, we don't hear much about it, but is, is the Catholic Church still persecuted in China? Uh, the Catholic Church is more intensely persecuted in China today than it has been at any time since the Cultural Revolution, uh, which began, of course, in the mid-1960s, and where you saw rioting Red Guards uh, of Chairman Mao uh, destroying churches, uh, beating up priests and parishioners, and uh, engaging in other, you know, acts, attacks on Catholics and, and Christians. Today, you have a new cultural revolution underway in China, uh, a kind of high-tech cultural revolution in China. But the aim is the same. The aim is to destroy all religious sentiment in China um, and replace it replace belief in God with belief in the Chinese Communist Party and replace the church, the Catholic Church, 
with a kind of ultra-nationalist Church of China in which the acolytes will be members of the Chinese Communist Party and uh, the leader of the Church of China will be, of course, the supreme leader, Xi Jinping himself. That is the goal of the Chinese Communist Party. They've made it very clear over the last couple of years by publishing a series of increasingly harsh restrictions on religious behavior in China. The last set of restrictions came out in February of, of uh, 2020. And those restrictions make it clear that every religious group in China, not just Catholics, but Christians uh, of all stripes, including uh, Tibetan Buddhists and Muslims and Taoists and, and everyone who professes any sort of belief in something beyond the here and now. Uh, they are all, the, all of these institutions are to be turned into adjuncts of the Chinese Communist Party. They are in their meetings. Uh, the priests in their homilies are to praise the Chinese Communist Party and encourage the parishioners to follow the current party line and encourage respect and, and adulation of core leader Xi Jinping. This is in the regulations. Now, at the same time, the Chinese Communist Party is rewriting the Bible to make it conform to Communist Party doctrine. So what do you do? Well, you remove from the Bible all references to the hereafter. You know, all references by our Lord to um, Gehenna, all references to uh, the heavenly kingdom, to God the Father in heaven, are to be eliminated, and it is to be in turn, turned into an entirely secular instrument to be used to help indoctrinate people in the importance of uh, supporting the Communist Party and its leadership. So that's what's happening right now. And so you have Communist Party officials going into churches and collecting all of the Bibles in those churches uh, because those are not the permitted texts. The official texts yet have yet to be published. And collecting all of the other spiritual works in the church and destroying them and replacing them with multiple copies of the collected works of core leader Xi Jinping himself and, you know, uh, other works supporting communism. That's what the people in the church are supposed to be reading and meditating upon now. And last thing I want to mention is that everyone in China has a cell phone, and the government of China uses your cell phone to track you. Uh, they track where you're going, what you're doing, what you're buying, what you're saying, what you're tweeting on the Chinese version of uh, Twitter, which is called Weibo. And, and they also make you download on your cell phone what's called the Xi Jinping app. And the Xi Jinping app, which is called Study Xi Strong China, four characters, Study Xi Strong China, is an app that you're supposed to open and study for 20 minutes of every day. You read one of the works of Xi Jinping, and then just to make sure that you've, you've followed what you've been reading, and you just haven't kept your phone open and gone to do something else, you have to answer questions on the daily reading, the daily uh, missile of Xi Jinping reading, you might say. And uh, everyone in China is required to do that every day. So uh, Americans have, you know, have trouble understanding how intrusive the high-tech surveillance state is in China, uh, but it infringes on your life every day in, in multiple ways. And of course, you can add to that the destruction of churches, the fact that crosses are being knocked off to the top of churches, that priests are being required to not only register with the government, but report all of their activities to the government. Every mass they hold, every, every trip they make, everything they say and do, they have to report in advance to the Office of Religious Affairs. So the walls are closing in on, on, on Catholics in China, not just in the underground church, which has been sacrificed uh, by the Sino-Vatican deal, uh, but it's closing in on the so-called patriotic church as well. So anyone in the Vatican who thought in their naivete that, that, that if they signed an agreement with the Chinese Communist Party, that at least the patriotic church would be kind of safe haven for Catholics in China is terribly mistaken because it's not a safe haven at all. It too is being persecuted because the ultimate goal is the elimination of all religious belief in China. I think through history... Whenever good compromises with evil, the compromise is washed away and the only ones who gain are the evil ones. 
especially with communist regimes. If you compromise to, to communism, the outcome is always negative. Well, what I know is this. I know that several months before the agreement was signed in September of, uh, of uh, 2018, I went to Rome. I sat down with Cardinal Pietro Parolin for, for an hour, and I told him what was happening in China. I told him the sorts of things that I've just recounted to, to, to you about the intensifying persecution of the church, about the new cultural revolution. And I told him that now is not the time to sign the, any kind of agreement with China. At which time he said, well, the agreement is already negotiated. We're just waiting for the Chinese side to come over and sign it. And I said, if the Chinese side comes over and sign it, you must know that they will violate the agreement before the ink is dry on the paper. And they will use the agreement uh, to bludgeon, to bully uh, the underground church into joining the patriotic church. It will be used against faithful Catholics in China. And I began to recount to him the various new measures that were being taken, including the requirement for all priests to register with the government in return for being allowed to continue to function as priests. And the good cardinal said, well, we have no objection to priests being required to register with the government. And you, I had to think that he thought of it sort of like uh, going down to the DMV and getting a driver's license. But registration with the government does not mean simply getting a license from the state, as if it's some sort of simple form you fill out, and then you're allowed to go on with your life, uh, your priestly vocation. Registration with the state means that you have to attend uh, state re-education sessions in what you should be doing and saying as a priest uh, to accord with the new regulations governing religious activity in China. Uh, the new the registration with the state means that, that, that you must uh, tell all of the people who work for you in the church, uh, you must tell all of your catechists, you must tell everyone in the church, the parishioners, what the new rules are, and that everyone is required to obey them. You're required, in effect, to become a functionary of the Chinese Communist Party in order to function as a priest. And those two things are diametrically opposed. If you are the first, you cannot be the second. Wow. Now, to wrap up, could we please pray a Hail Mary for the persecuted Catholics in China who are suffering? Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And also, can you tell us about your book, Bully of Asia? We'd like to hear more about it. Well, the book is called Bully of Asia. I have a copy right here, and it shows on the cover the Chinese dragon. The Chinese dragon has been the symbol of China, of course, from the very beginning of the formation of Chinese culture. And I think it's a very appropriate symbol because a long time ago, in the formative years of Chinese political culture, China invented totalitarianism. And it invented a kind of primitive form of communism where you had 200 years before the birth of Christ, you had a secret police, you had political commissars in the military, uh, you had a personality cult surrounding the emperor, you had song and dance troops, propaganda corps going around the country, singing the praises of the emperor, you had concentration camps, uh, you had the collective farming of the fields, you had the government controlling uh, the production of steel and, and salt and other economic goods. So you had an early form of totalitarianism. And what you see in China today is a more developed form of that ancient totalitarianism that China has been practicing for thousands of years. You have an overlay of communism uh, on top of this, uh, but ultimately it's a very ancient and, and very harsh form of government. We know the Chinese Communist Party will one day uh, cease to exist. We know the Chinese people are capable of self-government. We've seen that in the free elections on Taiwan. And we can only hope for the safety of the Chinese people, the well-being of the Chinese people, and for the safety and well-being of the world that that day comes sooner rather than later. So that's what I was writing about in the Bully of Asia, the history of China and where China might go in the future. Uh, the Chinese Communist Party will collapse and anything we can do to hasten the collapse uh, will be good for the Chinese people. And, and good for the world. 
Thank you for all the information, Mr. Mosier. It was great talking to you and uh, we appreciate your time. Most of all, we appreciate what you're doing to fight for the unborn, to protect the family and unmask the Chinese Communist Party. And, and, and you too, God bless you all for your work and for what the good work that you do. Thank you, God bless you.